Hello and welcome to my April Patreon Q&A video and it is almost, yeah, it's almost June at this point. We're, we're in the second half of May and it's, yeah, it's been crazy busy. I keep saying that and I said at the beginning of the year 2018 was going to be a crazy year and it has been. So much going on, but I'm going to sit down now and answer uh, the questions from my Patreon supporters. Uh, I've had quite a few in on the Facebook page and through Patreon itself, and a lot of these I haven't really had too much time to think about, like literally just sitting down, filming the video, is about as much time as I can spare right now, uh, and I feel like I'm becoming a broken record with that by the way, going, oh I'm so busy, I'm so busy. It must be great and on some people I'm sure, but it is what it is, I have to kind of say it to excuse how late the video is. So I have the questions up on my phone, and we're going to roll into them right now from Graham uh, from Man vs. Film. What are your top five most precious to you Blu-rays? Obviously that's, uh, well, it speaks for itself. Yeah, I don't need to <laughs> expand upon that question uh, any more than uh, uh, the question presents itself. What am I talking about? This is going to be a ridiculous video where I'm not even going to sound like a normal functioning human being. I'm going to try and roll through with more words and sound like I know what I'm talking about. Right, for one, this thing right here, the Harry Potter Wizards Collection, that would be number one, I think. Not my favourite film series of all time, but a, a film series and a, a story series that I'm a huge fan of and has such a, a powerful connection to my childhood and uh, my my younghood. You know, like as a teenager growing into a man, I feel like Harry Potter was so uh, important to my life, you know, just as uh, getting me through hard times, literally. You know, Harry Potter was there to spark my imagination when I was a kid. I'm going into the whole Harry Potter thing, this is going to take forever, but, you know, the Wiz Wizards Collection is just, I think, the best box set I've ever seen for anything. Like, it's so incredible, so elaborate, so deluxe, and, uh, you know, just, it's incredible. So that's probably the number one most precious to me. Number two, uh, not that we're doing this in order, but thinking of another precious Blu-ray to me, it's probably the Breaking Bad uh, Barrel box set, which is... Uh, you know, just a really cool, again, deluxe edition of just the best TV series ever made. Just love Breaking Bad so much, and the Barrel box set is just one of those kinds of deluxe presentations of a film. I think the third one, uh, again, not in order, but I, I definitely put Harry Potter at the top. So, um, yeah, the, the, the next four, or three, because I've already mentioned one, I'm so sorry, this is terrible, uh, would be the Blade Runner briefcase uh, box set. Just, again, <laughs> a nice deluxe edition of a film that I love so much. And a single film, you know, in Harry Potter we have a whole series, Breaking Bad, it's a TV series, Blade Runner, it's a single movie set, and uh, yeah. And to pick two others that are precious to me, I mean, can I actually like spin around now and actually have a look at my collection? There's a, there's a lot, there's a few criterions that perhaps would be fairly special to me, but, uh, ah, of course, my Japanese edition of Porco Rosso, my favorite animated film of all time. Uh, Connie was in uh, Japan for a month, five years ago now, Jesus Christ, and uh, I said, if you, can you try and find the, the Japanese edition of Porco Rosso? She found it in a used shop, perfect condition, because those Ghibli editions in Japan are so outrageously expensive, so she got it for a good price and gave it to me as a gift, which was awesome, and so that's kind of the one Japanese edition of my Ghibli collection, and it's one of my favorite films, I think that one definitely... Number five, what would we go with? A, a precious Blu-ray to me. Um, hmm. I don't know, because th there's films I love, but the, the, the edition isn't so, like, super precious. I'm trying to think if there's something that just really jumps out at me as, uh, you know, like, that. that's a special edition. Uh, the Lord of the Rings set, but that's kind of easily replaceable as well. There's no, like, uh, I'm thinking of stuff that's limited, that is hard to, to get hold of. You know, uh, I don't know, I can't think of a fifth one that immediately jumps out to me as, like, that's really, yeah. I think the Thor Steelbook, actually, because that was um, a gift, which was so incredible, because it was a steelbook that could have been sold for so much money. Uh, but this person uh, gave it to me just because they knew how much I wanted it. And it's a gorgeous steelbook, and I love the film, so I think that one. And there's loads of those where I've had gifts from people. You know, I could put in the Rushmore Criterion that Robbie Webster sent to me many many moons ago that was that was a really special gesture and so that one's up there too so there we go <laughs> there's uh, six uh, blu-rays that are the most precious to me he also throws in uh, graham 
Uh, top five TV shows of all time. Has to be TV, so Twin Peaks The Return doesn't count. You argued it was a movie. This is where I could segue into a whole spiel about the whole Twin Peaks The Return movie business. Uh, to me, Twin Peaks The Return is the Schrodinger's cat <laughs> of entertainment. It is a TV series, but it's also a movie. You know, I will. Uh, that's my hill to die on. But and hey, Letterboxd finally uh, reneged and, and allowed Twin Peaks The Return to be listed as a film on their website, which you, Graham, are a pro member of. So just saying, just saying. But my top five TV shows. This is a tough one. I have been thinking about this. I just can't really whittle it down. Um, as far as like definitive, these are the five all-time favorites. But number one, Breaking Bad. Just incredible. And I kind of, as an aside, kind of sneak in Better Call Saul. Because I think that that is pretty much just as good as Breaking Bad. But Breaking Bad's the, the granddaddy. Just one of the best stories ever told. Um, incredible acting. And probably the only TV series I can think of that literally just gets better and better with every season and ends on the best one. It's just, I don't know how they did it. You know, there's really a something to be said about like ending when the going is good and they really nailed it with that. Uh, Twin Peaks would probably be my close second actually and obviously I'm, I'm including you know the first two series of the original run. I'm including Twin Peaks The Return. Um, I guess I can't really include the movie but the whole universe and world of Twin Peaks I've become such a massive fan of and uh, yeah it's definitely up there, it's number two, it's right underneath Breaking Bad and uh, again <laughs> uh, Twin Peaks The Return uh, very much a part of that because it is a TV series and it is a movie as well so stew on that. Uh, Spaced has to be in the top five uh, probably my favorite comedy of all time such such fond memories of watching that show when it first came out on like fuzzy uh, TV, I'll turn off my uh, my automatic uh, room freshener there so it doesn't continue to <laughs> interrupt the video. Oh, nice vanilla bean blast of freshness there. Yeah, such fond memories of watching Space like uh, at one o'clock in the morning uh, in my bedroom in uh, Salisbury and uh, using my like little antenna. You know, when we used to actually have to plug those into the back of the TV and like bend it around and stuff and hold it up to get a better signal and just look grainy as shit, but then I could record it on video and stuff. You know, like, I just, that just seems like a whole life. Well, it is a whole lifetime away at this point, but but even now as an adult, Spaced is one of the best comedies I think I've ever made. Uh, such a brilliant show for people who are fans of movies and pop culture and get those kinds of references, but also smart writing and different direction. You know, doing something different with the medium of TV and space is, uh, yeah, he's, that, that would be my number three, I think. So we're kind of going in uh, the right order. But four and five, I mean, there's so many. You know, The Simpsons, I think, classic Simpsons is, is some of the best stuff. Uh, ooh, going to comedies, you've got stuff like The Office, you know, The Young Ones. I'm a huge fan of The Young Ones. Uh, drama stuff, I loved House with Hugh Laurie. That was a fantastic show. Mm. And I did a top a top twenty, I think, my favorite TV shows of all time. Uh, but I seem to be blanking <laughs> on quite a few of them now. But uh, I don't know. Comedy was my bread and butter when I was a kid, but I rarely watch comedy shows now. More into the drama stuff. You know, Stranger Things was a really good one, but I wouldn't put that in my top five list at all. I think Simpsons has got to be there. You know, uh, I, I tell you what, I would put in there actually. We'll, we'll go Simpsons number four, number five. Bit out of the box, Future Boy Conan, which is a Hayao Miyazaki uh, mainly directed uh, anime series from the 1970s. An incredible story about uh, a world uh, in which, well, <laughs> the world, you know, a future in which the world has been completely sunken, you know, sunken? Has sunken into, wait, what am I talking about? Let me get the word straight. The whole world has been engulfed in the ocean. There we go. Uh, the humans have developed thermonuclear weapons and they uh, end up just fucking up the whole world. So uh, everyone's gone and there's this one ship that tries to take off to go to another planet and then it gets pulled back down by the electricity and crash lands on the last island on Earth. And that's where we find, many years later, this young boy called Conan and his grandpa. And they're living there alone and then a mysterious girl washes ashore on the island and a huge adventure begins and it's just visually wonderful, so much fun, and 
you know, uh, basically a Miyazaki movie, but done over like 20 plus episodes, so you get this huge epic story, absolutely love it. Okay, so there we go, <laughs> and that's just Graham's questions, and we're now 10 minutes into my recording, holy shit. Uh, Alex uh, says, I never bother putting questions down straight away as you get around to filming them in the middle of the month. You were not wrong. Uh, what were your top, say, 5 to 10 uh, favorite pop, cu pop culture references of Ready Player One? Uh, top for me was definitely Samantha wearing Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures t-shirt and Chucky. Also Robocop and Iron Giant giving the thumbs up. That was a good one. I'll go with that one. The, the Terminator 2, Iron Giant, Thumbs Up. That's one. Um, yeah, okay. Kit's strip on the DeLorean was a cool. Didn't see that. There's so many things in Ready Player One that I think are still going to be getting found, especially when the Blu-ray comes out. Um, number one, the, ja the Jack Slater 3 reference, Last Action Hero. Couldn't believe that was in the film. Awesome. Uh, the Rush uh, 2112, I think, poster uh, in um, Halliday's bedroom at the end. That's one. Yoda, I'm sure I saw Yoda at one point. I love like just the more obscure stuff, like um, the main character. I forget his name. Going to that party as uh, Buckaroo Banzai, <laughs> that was just incredible. Uh, yeah, that's, if I go with like top five, I'd say those maybe. And uh, the shine, like the whole Shining thing, just amazing. Like that was just such a like I was just laughing in the cinema because I just was having so much fun watching that scene. So yeah, the, the thumbs up, Yoda, Jack Slater 3, the whole Shining sequence, and the Rush 2112 uh, poster, that was, that was great. Um, what directors do you feel are best at using non-orchestral music in their films and have the best soundtracks? Not scores! For me it would be Danny Boyle, Martin Scorsese, Edgar Wright, and David Lynch. Yes, I'm leaving out Tarantino. Um, I think Richard Linklater really has his finger on the pulse of that. Uh, in, in, in a film like uh, Dazed and Confused or Everybody Wants Some uh, but then he, he it's not really quite his uh, his wheelhouse, he doesn't use it all the time I guess you go to School of Rock but that's very much a film about that sort of stuff but he really brings that music in to some of those films but I think someone who, who really um, really nails it is Cameron Crowe at times like he, I mean he's almost famous you know he's, he's a guy who grew up kind of in that kind of music industry in a way and uh, following those bands around when he was younger and I think that really made an impression on him and, and moved into his films especially something like Vanilla Sky uh, where that kind of stuff is part of the story as well towards the end uh, you know and who do you put Martin Scorsese yeah I, I'd, I'd go along with that one Edgar Wright of course when you get to a film like Shaun of the Dead and you have the main characters beating a zombie uh, with pool cues to the beat of Don't Stop Me Now, like that's when you know you've kind of hit cinematic gold, I think. Uh, and David Lynch. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not as well versed in David Lynch's stuff to really uh, uh, comment on that, I guess, but that there's a really memorable moment in Blue Velvet that I saw recently that uh, uses a, is it a Roy Orbison song. Anyway, uh, yeah, directors who use kind of like just good music in their films. I guess the ones I just talked about. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Or is it Quentin Tarantino? You know, I would include there, I think. He, but uh, he, he very much has this whole pastiche that he does with not just music, but <laughs> you know, visual homaging and things like that. Uh, yeah, you know, Richard Linklater with Days of Confused and Everybody Wants Some. You know, films that kind of use the uh, the music of the time period to, to bring, a lot, bring alive that time period, I think. And it's bugging me because I feel like I'm missing out on someone really particular that uh, fits this thing like a glove but I just can't think off the top of my head it's really hard to do these things top of my head. I really should dig into them more and I, I can only apologize profusely but literally I, I haven't had a breather since about February and then he has a Lynch music question what were your favorite tracks performed at the Bang Bang Bar for me the winner by Miles was Rebecca Del Rio's No Stars which I listened to on loop for ages That was my least favorite. <laughs> I, I really li I liked it, but it just went on far too long. I guess it's going through the credits. Well, I don't know. It felt like it went on really long before even the credits started rolling. Uh, she has a great voice, but uh, it went on a bit too long for me. I would say, um, ooh, because I listened to some quite heavily on repeat. The uh, who is it? Is it the Chromatics? I think I'm not sure. Um, but it was what's the song called? I know it because I listened to it so much. 
Uh, it was used at the beginning of the the second episode. Uh, I forgot the song. It's on tip of my tongue, but it's gone. The other one was Wild Wild West or Wild Wild West, I think. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, Lissy with Wild West. You put in brackets, amazing. Uh, the Nine Inch Nails one was very uh, interesting and suitable for the episode. Yes, the uh, the Eddie Vedder one was really good. I liked that a lot. Uh, that, that's Shadow. I think it was Shadow. Yeah, I really loved that one. The thing with that Wild West song was that I thought it was a great song, but the, the performance of her lip syncing it was awful, <laughs> like it was really bad, uh, which is a shame, it kind of took me out of it, but I, I then listened to the music independently and just thought, like, fantastic. Really, really cool kind of rocking song, I liked that one a lot. Uh, so yeah, kind of, yeah, the Eddie Vedder, uh, the Lissy one, and then the Shadow, I think it's called Shadow, the Chromatics, is it Chromatics? It might not be, I'm pretty sure they did something though, yeah, there we go. Another Lynch question, how do you think David Lynch's version of Return of the Jedi would have turned out Would he ha uh, had he have directed the film? What changes would have been made and on the same level of darkness as The Empire Strikes Back? It's a good question. Um, if you look at something like The Elephant Man, you know, where he can do something straight, but he has his own little, like, the opening montage is very kind of surreal. You know, that kind of the elephants and stuff and the black background. So I I like to think that you know maybe he would uh, expand upon the you know, if, if he were to take it seriously, which I don't think he really did. I think that he you know was impressed by kind of the you know the whole world and everything, but it wasn't really something that he felt fit into his uh, um, his you know mission statement on making films. I don't know. There's something that uh, clearly he he wasn't you know feeling on a personal level like I want to make this film because he didn't do it and was offered to do it. I think he might have expanded on something like the the cave scene in Empire Strikes Back where Luke sees the vision of Vader, you know, and maybe doing something like that, a bit more surreal, perhaps. But for the most part, I think he would have, uh, you know, gone in line with what well, he he didn't do it. So I, I guess it's it's weird to say what he I think he would have done, but I think he would have, you know, gone along with uh, because it isn't just this thing where the director gets to come in and just completely change everything. George had a vision of how he wanted that that trilogy to go and everything, and. Uh, you know, Lynch would have gone along with that, but I think that, uh, yeah, he would have had his own touches in there, but it wouldn't have overridden things, I don't think, because again, we had, I think Lawrence Kasdan wrote that one as well, so it's uh, working from that script, and uh, I don't feel like he would have done a complete reshuffle of things and done it completely radically different or anything, but, uh, you know, clearly, again, from Elephant Man, you can see that he, he was able to make something that isn't a razor head and, and make a great film, but... You know, you can kind of have his own little tiny, his little traces of his fingerprints there. So I think that's what he probably would have done, is taken some elements of, you know, things that he'd done before and imprinted those onto the film in a non-evasive way, I feel. I feel it could have worked. Uh, again, maybe something like a dream sequence or a, a vision, much like we had in Empire. That's, that's all I can really think of when it comes to that. But uh, it would have been interesting either way uh, to see if he would have, you know, tried to push it even further. Uh, thank you for the questions, and thank you Graham for the question. Thank you everyone for the questions. It's uh, it's nice to get them, even if I, <laughs> I have to kind of badger people for them, and then don't get around to doing it for half a month. Um, Scott from Cineram says, Now that you've seen Infinity War, where do you think Marvel Studios have demonstrated the best of what their films can be, and what elements could use the most improvement? Uh, now that I've seen Infinity War, where do I think Marvel Studios have demonstrated the best of what their films can be? Um, They've demonstrated that they they know how to entertain people. It's as, it's as simple as that, you know. Um, the films work, you know. The, the 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 box office grosses tell you that much. I think it's just hit after hit after hit. I think that Black Panther and Infinity War has to be the biggest one-two punch from a movie studio in, in all of all time. You know, within two months, these two billion-dollar-plus worldwide-grossing movies, they know what they're doing. They've put a formula together. And uh, uh, who who is it I was I was talking to, or disagreeing with somewhere? Someone I like got Twitter maybe or Facebook or YouTube comments. Someone was saying like you know these Marvel films are soulless. You know they're just a big money making machine and all this kind of. I think it was on Twitter. And and my argument was look, yeah Marvel is is owned by Disney. You know and Disney is a big corporation. But uh, do you know how Disney started? It was from a storyteller, Walt Disney. You know, or a guy who wanted these stories to be told, you know, and, and got the best storytellers around to tell those stories. Now it's a bit more corporate and things like that, but ultimately, you still have the storytellers, you know, somewhere in that kind of link of the chain of command, in the middle, getting to tell their story. 
you know, that if, if they weren't there, then these films wouldn't be working. If these films were pure kind of product, they wouldn't work. And there's an alarm there, and there's nothing I can do about that, I apologise. But, you know, the, the, people get really just kind of bogged down this whole, ah, oh, Disney, evil corporation, just doing it for the money. No, Disney, you know, they love the fact that, you know, the, the, the kind of corporate heads, they love the fact that they can make all this money and they can, you know, push the merchandise and stuff and, and you know, that they get more money and, and, you know, there's that business side of it. But then you have the storytellers who are reaping the rewards of that by getting to tell their stories and to connect with people and to bring emotions out. You look at someone like James Gunn directing Guardians of the Galaxy, Taika Waititi directing Thor Ragnarok. These are real true storytellers getting to do their thing on the grandest stage possible when it comes to a big budget blockbuster. I think that's what Marvel are now starting to demonstrate is that they can take guys like the Russos and have them make like the prototypical big Marvel movie and, and absolutely excel at making a really solid film that entertains and kind of has the wow factor. But they can also hire people like Taika Waititi, like James Gunn, to do these uh, different takes on the films and they're starting to freshen it up a bit more. Thor Ragnarok for me was a breath of fresh air, it just felt a bit more different, a bit more off the cuff, you know? So I hope to see more of that. Where could they improve? I think that, you know, it's hard to Im improve when you do have to follow that structure of there's a superhero or superheroes, they need to fight a bad guy, and you know, we have a bit of fun and adventure in the middle, and then they beat the bad guy. You know, it has to follow that thing. So where could they improve? By not having them beat the bad guy at the end and they just did it in Infinity War you know spoilers so um, I don't know it's gonna be really interesting to see how this thing continues as far as the first 10 years of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is concerned uh, they nailed it <laughs> they absolutely crushed it um, the 20th film is coming out in a few months and there's no signs of slowing you know um, where are we gonna be on film 30 film 40 film 50 with a hold up it's gonna have to buckle at some point, but uh, you know, I, I feel like there's the, you know they, there's not much they need to improve on. They seem to have nailed it there pretty well, because I'm loving the films they're doing. They're making a boatload of money. Seems like everyone's happy for the most part. And uh, also, are there any particular X-Men characters that have appeared in a film already, but you think the Marvel Cinematic Universe should recast or change in some way? Uh, I, I do love the X-Men films, I'm trying to think. Um, I, I really like Jean Grey, and I think that there's so much potential with that character that kind of got squandered a bit in the third X-Men film. Um, but I don't know about recasting, I don't have any particular ideas. I, I would really like, it's never going to happen, but I would really like them to just never touch Wolverine again. You know, <laughs> like, bring bring Laura back, you know, do, do X-23. You know, bring her into the Marvel, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how that would work, because Logan was kind of set way into the future, or well, not way into the future, but it's still enough to kind of be outside of the timeline of what Marvel Cinematic Universe is set in. But, uh, yeah, I mean, do you really need a guy with claws and kind of, uh, you know, most superheroes are indestru indestructible and healing to some point. I just, I'm going on off a tangent here, but I, I really feel like they should just leave that Wolverine thing. You know, at least for like 20 years or something, but it's never going to happen. They're going to recast, they're going to try and do it again, and maybe it'll work, who knows, but X-Men, you know, it is tricky because I really like the current incarnation they've got going. I think Fassbender and McAvoy are an incredible kind of a duo as Magneto and Xavier. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine the X-Men in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I have to say, and trying to think where it would slot in and uh, how it would work. You know, is, are there too many elements at play? But then again, I thought Infinity War would probably turn out like a big clusterfuck, and it kind of worked, even though they had all these characters. So, yeah, I could be proven wrong, but I, it's going to happen eventually, you know, and I actually was talking to my brother earlier today, and he's like, oh, he's getting so excited about Deadpool and the Marvel Cinema, you know, so, you know, kids are going to be all over this and stuff, and, you know, big fans of the comics and things, but for me, it's, uh, it's going to be difficult to imagine those characters in a different context and recast, you know, because I feel like they probably would have to, it'd be very weird if they took characters from a different set of a franchise and put it into a new franchise but it's the same actors, I don't know. Uh, and then you just start getting to the dangerous territory of like, you know, having Deadpool in an Avengers movie and kind of commenting on the fact he's in an Avengers movie and then it just kind of doesn't work, I feel like, I don't know. So yeah, I'm sorry if that isn't a very satisfactory answer, but um, 
I don't have any particular kind of characters or actors on my wish list as far as that is concerned with the X-Men characters coming into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, thank you for the questions. Aaron Pennington says, do you like video essay channels like Every Frame of Painting? Yes, uh, well, I don't watch many of them. That was one, Every Frame of Painting, I thought was a fantastic uh, channel, some great videos, watched almost all of them, I think. Watched the Buster Keaton one a few times, uh, that was just so great. It was great to see, like, because uh, that channel had such an audience when it was in its prime, and then to pull out, like, you know, say, oh, David Fincher, you know, and, like, uh, all these kind of like hip things like you know like drive and you know, all these people watching it and then he's like right now Buster Keaton you know and so like it got like a million plus views and it's like yeah a lot more people are getting exposed to the brilliance of Buster Keaton I've watched a lot of Hayao Miyazaki video essays because I'm such a huge fan of the director and I like seeing people's different takes on uh, his films but I don't I, I confess that there's so many of them and I, I find it really difficult to get into video essays uh, based on the voice, like the cadence, the tone. Like I feel like, uh, and it's really difficult. Like I, I can't do it. I can't do a good video essay voice. I don't feel like it. I, I listen to myself when I do video essays, and I feel like that just sounds, uh, I don't know, hollow to me. I don't know, it feels very routine, you know. And it's something I guess I haven't tried to work at to to get to sound more natural. But that's a thing for me. Like it needs to feel that there needs to be something in the presentation that. Uh, that makes me believe what I'm hearing. I mean, it's not like that, that you need to act, but you kind of do actually, you know. So yeah, there's not many that I, I watch, and certainly not many channels I actively go, "Ooh, are they doing another video essay?" But I do really like them when they're done well. I think it's a great form of uh, not only entertainment, but obviously education, and uh, it's very informative if done right and if researched properly. So um, yeah, I love video essays, and Every Frame of Painting was a fantastic example of that. I think. Um, what did you think of the Star Wars Battlefront 2 loot box controversy? Uh, terrible. Terrible because I think it was so overblown and it kind of killed what the game could have been. You know, uh, a lot of people are unhappy right now with the current state of the game. I'm kind of a little bit indifferent. I'm still loving it, still playing it regularly, but it could have been so much more if the whole thing hadn't happened and I don't necessarily agree with the outrage. I understand it, you know. They should have just gone with paying for cosmetics, um, but at the same time, you could play the game and earn everything that you could also buy by just playing the game, you know. And if you are that kind of outraged by it, like oh, I can't believe that, da, 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 you know, then just play the game, you know. And then oh, well, I haven't got time to play it and all this kind of stuff. I don't know. Is it really that big of a problem in the grand scheme of things? Yeah, I've ranted about this before, and uh, yeah. Although again, I I do feel like there is there is a lot of legitimacy to the complaints. I just think when it gets taken to outrage levels, when it gets taken to you know let's uh, let's let's boycott the game, you know let's let's try to kind of send them a message and things like that. And I guess they did, you know, because it became so huge that they turned off the the loot boxes, right? So in in some in some ways it was a positive thing because they actually changed the course. But overall, I think it was just a bit. I mean, so many games have uh, things you can buy, and I understand that it was you could buy to. It was the whole pay to win. Uh, that was the buzzword of the the whole controversy. Pay to win. Pay to win. You get you pay to win the game. No, you don't. You pay to upgrade. You've still got to be good at the game and and know what you're doing. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm mixed on it, but uh, overall I think it was just far too overblown. Uh, next question is, since Disney is in the process of purchasing 20th Century Fox, it seems like only a matter of time before the X-Men will cross over with the MCU. How do you think they should handle it, combine both universes, or just give X-Men a clean reboot? So I've kind of been talking about this in the previous questions, but this is a little bit different. Um, I'm not sure, you know. Combining the two would, would, would be really uh, interesting because you have a lot of history with the X-Men films dating back you know, almost 20 years now. Uh, but then again, I, I'm, I'm not even the biggest fan of how they kind of retconned but most of that with Days of Future Past, you know? It's like all those movies didn't happen, uh, well, some of them. So, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I feel like what they're going to do is just do a reboot of, of the X-Men series. And I guess the, the, the current series will end. And then we'll we'll start anew. That that feels like probably the best thing to do, 
because then you you're not dealing with previous history and stuff. I mean, it would be so cool to see you know characters brought over for, with the same actors and things like that and the same histories. But I don't feel like it works for what the Marvel Cinematic Universe is, which is why we didn't have Tobey Maguire coming in as Spider Man or Andrew Garfield coming in as Spider Man. We had Tom Holland, and that worked out great. So I think that they're probably going to go with recasting and rebooting the X-Men as characters in, in this series and I think that's probably the right way to go about it as well. Thank you for the questions. Uh, Michael Cohen says, um, most anticipated game for the rest of the year or beyond? Um, beyond La The Last of Us Part 2, so excited for that game. Uh, the first one is the best game I've ever played and my favorite game of all time so obviously I'm hugely excited for the second one and I I love the fact that it's taken them so long to do it. It's not something they've rushed into. And uh, I think we're going to get some news about it in the next couple of months, or next month, uh, E3. So I'm hoping some kind of release date or release year. I mean, it might not be for another couple of years, I don't know, but that's the one I'm. That's the big one. Uh, Red Dead uh, Redemption 2. That one I'm hugely excited for. I think that's, just, that's this year. That's a big one. Uh, but also uh, Detroit Beyond Human, which I played the demo for. Uh, a few weeks ago, <sighs> incredible, love that so much, so that's an that was it Quantic Dream, I think, the the, the company who did uh, Beyond Two Souls and Heavy Rain, yeah, uh, that one I'm really excited for, so whenever you're around to play in that, it's going to be a good day at the office uh, as a gamer, I think, but yeah, th those, those are the few I think that uh, are on my radar, not a huge gamer as far as the current stuff goes, I mean, so many new games coming out all the time, like the big God of War game just came out. I'm just like, you know, uh, sure it's very good, but I hadn't. It wasn't on my radar at all. How excited are you for Solo? Yeah, you know, uh, it's got Star Wars in the title, so looking forward to it. I I'm excited because Chewbacca's in it. I love Chewbacca, so uh, if I get some good Chewy stuff, I'll be happy. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I have an open mind about it. We'll, we'll say that. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm hugely excited. Thoughts on WrestleMania 34 and the Greatest Royal Rumble? I wanted to do a, a Wrestle Diary about that. Maybe I can do that. Um, I think I'll do that. I'll do I'll do a Wrestle Diary, and I'll kind of catch people up on what I'm thinking about uh, wrestling uh, lately. So I'll leave that to a separate video if you don't mind, because I, I could get into that, and it would take like probably like 10, 15, 20 minutes. If you're given the chance to make a movie, what genre would it be? Oh. I, I'd say drama, like, you know, my my heart wants to say big sci-fi, big fantasy, my head says, you know, drama, I'd love to do a, a great knockout drama, I think I would, I think I would do a really good job at it too, and I would love to kind of just stoke um, the actor's um, performances, you know, and emotions, and getting into into the heads of characters and how they work, how they make a story fit together. That that would really excite me. So, yeah, I think drama would be the genre. Thank you for the questions. Uh, Justin Peterson asks, are there any films that played a part in shaping your love of film that were introduced to you by a family member? For me, it was Sound and Music from my mother, uh, The Exorcist, Alien, and Raiders of the Lost Ark from my dad, and finally Evil Dead 2 from my uncle. Uh, great question, thanks. Um, I think Aliens, and I've told the story uh, to death at this point, but you never know who's watching. Um, it was the first film I ever saw when I was before, uh, you know, one year old. I was I was zero, <laughs> year zero of Luke, and uh, my mum got the video it just come out, I think, on VHS, and she watched it, and I sat and was quiet for the whole thing, apparently. And uh, maybe the story has just become embellished over the years, but I have a very early memory of having this dream of, about the film. And when I was like, I don't know, 10, 11, I think, 10, 11, I think is when I watched it. And I was like, really like, can I watch it? Can I watch it? Can I watch it? Can I watch it? More because of the story, I think, than anything else of me watching it when I was a baby. Watched it, loved it, became one of my favorite films, and uh, is still in my top five, top three, really, I think. Well... Yeah, probably top three. Love Aliens. And and there's also kind of this this extra connection with my mum, which is that um, back then when I watched the film with her for the first time, she kind of looked like Ripley in the film. And, uh, you know, with the kind of the short curly hair, but, and the, the colour of the hair, but also the, you know, body type, but also the temperament, you know. 
So uh, I always see a lot of my mum in Ripley in the film, um, purely on that kind of level of just the way that she is and looks, but also because of watching the film with her and everything like that. And it has been such a huge part of my film loving life, loving that film, so it has kind of shaped my love of film, I think, because uh, that's kind of one of the benchmarks of my fandom of cinema, I think. It's always going to be one of my favorite films of all time. Seven Samurai, I kind of linked to my dad, even though I'm not even sure. You know, he's, he's seen it, but I'm not even sure how much he likes it. But I remember him talking about it, or mentioning it when I was a kid. So when I first got a chance to watch it, it was because, oh, that's the film my dad talked about, you know. And so uh, every time I'd watch a new Kurosawa film, I'd go to my dad, like, oh, I watched Seven Samurai, you know. So it'll always make me think of him, even though it's a very uh, kind of three degrees of separation kind of deal, I think. Um, and, uh, you know what? I would say Karate Kid uh, from Connie. She showed it to me a couple of years ago in one of the 24-hour movie marathons, and that film has just become such a, a massive part of my love of films, you know, uh, my love of characters in films, Mr. Miyagi. Like, we actually just watched uh, Cobra Kai, and, uh, and that was a great experience to watch out with her for the first time and experience this, this new chapter in the story and everything, and a character that means so much to both of us and has meant more to her because she grew up with it and, and now I get to kind of share that you know so that's that's a special thing to me so there's a few answers I guess um, and you know I, I could go into kind of just films I you know link to certain people but that would be a whole other video probably uh, Daniel Smith asks have you moved back to Wales permanently yes no <laughs> I'll say that much uh, I'm all over the place at the minute uh, Wales permanently uh, yeah it, it, it's 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 up in the air. It's, it's the balance has yet to be made, I suppose. Uh, how often do you reread the Harry Potter novels? Um, I don't. <laughs> uh, I would love to reread them every year. Don't have the time, you know. Uh, well, I do have the time. If I if I was to just not watch films, I could have the time. But that's kind of where my priorities lie as a media consumer. So, when did I last read the Harry Potter books? It's I don't know. I think I I think I reread Deathly Hallows about eight years ago. It's been far too long. I want to read them again, you know. But uh, yeah, it, it's probably going to be one of those once every five to ten years things, maybe even more. Why not we have kids though? You know, if if we get to have kids, I think that would be uh, a more regular thing. So um, that would be fun and a way to to kind of share that and also enjoy it myself at the same time. But again, if I had my way and I had more hours in the day, if I if I was a uh, to about time my life, I think I would reread them every year. On a scale of one to ten, how excited are you for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Um, about an eight, I think. Uh, always interested in what Tarantino's doing. I really like his films a lot, and uh, the cast looks to be very good, so that's exciting. Um, but I'm not like you know, Defcon Five about it or anything. What will your next midnight screening be? Probably episode 9, I think. Star Wars episode 9. Yeah. There's a midnight screening next week for Solo, but um, yeah, I haven't got the time. Well, I th again, I could make the time. I keep saying I haven't got the time, but it's, uh, you know, need to do more important things. And, you know, going to the premiere for a film I'm not that excited about, eh, it's probably not the best thing to be doing. But I'll be, I'll be seeing Solo on opening day, I think. I'll have time for that, but um, midnight probably going to be episode 9, the next one, the next big movie I can think of anyway. Oh, actually, probably uh, Infinity, not Infinity, uh, Avengers 4, whatever they call it, the next Avengers movie. I'll definitely go see the midnight of that if I can, because it was great, the midnight premiere of, of Infinity War, well, that was a lot of fun. Have you ever watched any of Hello Greedo's YouTube videos? If not, you should check out his channel. No, but I am aware of his channel, so I think uh, I'll, I'll check him out when I can. Thanks. Did you watch any of the recent anniversary specials of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I did not, sorry. Um, <laughs> do you plan on watching the new season of Arrested Development? I do not, unfortunately. I haven't seen any of that show before, so I uh, wouldn't want to jump in uh, at a point where I don't know what's going on. Um, I keep hearing about that show, but I've, I don't know what it's about or anything really, so sell it to me in the comments, anyone. What are your thoughts on Tarantino's potential involvement with Star Trek? Uh, it's intriguing, you know, you think, where, where's he going to take that? 
if he does. And then again, I'm not, I haven't read up. I'm not sure. Is he going to direct one? Is he going to write one? Produce one? I'm not sure. I think immediately people jump to like, oh, it's going to be like, you know, motherfucker this, motherfucker that, and it's going to be like completely tarantino eyes, and it's going to be all, you know, uh, like like his movies, but in space. And I don't think I don't think it's going to be that. I think he's smart enough to do do something that that is in line with what a Star Trek movie should be. You know, uh, look at something like Kill Bill, which for the most part feels like a kind of an old kung fu movie. You know, with his own kind of flourish to it. Um, I, I think he's probably wise enough, especially at this stage in the game. If he was to make one again, I'm not too sure what he's doing with it, but. I think he would, he, he'd toe in line more with the style of movie that uh, the Star Trek movie is, but but it would have his own thing to it. But then I just think of, again, it's it's hard not to imagine just the, you know, a spaceship movie where you just have all characters speaking long monologues to each other, you know, with a little bit of, a of action, but it's mostly character based. So, I don't know, it'd be really intriguing if, if it does come to pass. Are you going to buy the PS4's new Spider-Man game? Maybe <laughs> at some point. I mean, I mean, I love Spider-Man, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I know it's a game that's been hyped up for many years now. Uh, at least a couple of years it's been talked about. So uh, I remember, what is, I think it was Spider-Man or Spider-Man Two for the PS PS Two, where you could actually just swing around the city. Like oh, that was amazing. That was so cool when it first came out. So I wouldn't mind that if it's if it's like open worldy. Then actually, I probably would be interested in getting it. Maybe around Christmas or something. And finally, the last question uh, from Daniel Smith. Thank you for the questions. What is your preferred method of selling Blu-rays? Uh, not CEX, <laughs> um, you know, where they just they just absolutely fleece you for all you're worth. You know, uh, you got a deluxe edition of a classic film for the 1920. Yeah, we'll give you 20p or 70p in store credit. Uh, I don't know. My preferred method of selling, it's an odd question, especially to end this whole video on. Uh, I would say my preferred method of selling is directly to someone who really wants what I'm selling. You know, I, I sold the uh, limited edition of Society, the Arrow Video edition, to someone on Blu-ray.com who really wanted it. And, uh, you know, it was, I had it in perfect condition. Enjoyed the film, but didn't really want to keep the special edition. And uh, I said, you can have it for as much as it costs, you know. And they were like, oh, thank you so much. Like, really pretty, because it's out of print, you know. So, yeah, I like that when I can kind of make someone's day and, you know, they can get an edition they really want for the price that it was originally sold for. I like doing that. Uh, not that I've done it very much, but, you know, it's uh, it's the thought that counts, uh, I suppose. But, yeah, kind of CEX offloading is always kind of a, a drag. And eBay selling, you're always wondering if someone's going to try and screw you over because there's, there's so many dodgy people on there who just try and... Uh, uh, you know, to bend the rules, I suppose. And and where else would you sell Blu-rays, I guess? Um, you know, there's kind of Facebook groups. and th Yeah, more directly to someone, where it's a bit more personal, I think. So, anyway, <laughs> there we go. hope that the, the answer was satis satisfactory, and I hope all my answers were satisfactory. It's been a long one, but thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Hey, you're all right by me. <laughs> Apart from the fact he throws cans and calling into a tree. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. Yeah, he's really cool. He's, but he's not quite as cool as you. Cause...